Hello and welcome to the Quarterdeck series of the United Kingdom Defence Academy, a programme of extracurricular evening talks that explore ideas and meaning through the arts and culture. The Quarterdeck series was inaugurated in October 2014 and while not part of the core syllabus, the programme is designed to complement the Defence Academy's ethos of developing minds that are open, flexible and capable of conceptualising ideas. The Quartex series offers an encounter with interesting subjects, often with a philosophical theme, which aims to provoke thinking and expand knowledge horizons. At the same time, it is hoped the programme will energise the faculties of reason and logic to improve discernment and better equip us to challenge some, at least, of the assumptions that the contemporary world liberally dispenses. I hope you enjoy the programme. gentlemen, good evening. A warm welcome to our fifth Quartex series lecture. For those that have been with us before, you'll see there's a slight change to proceedings. We've got a panel discussion, and that's to hopefully give us a more a wide, wider and, and more varied uh, approach and perspective to the topic in hand, which is modernism and postmodernism uh, are in the throes of a decadent culture. Uh, we have an hour and 15 minutes to unpack that uh, very interesting topic, so we'll get straight to it. Um, our panel's uh, our panellists the, this evening, first of all we have uh, at the lectern, uh, Mr. Alexander Poot. Uh, Alex was born in Russia. Uh, he now lives in the UK and has done so since 1998. Uh, he's taught English literature, he's an art critic, uh, he's a film critic, he's a retired businessman, and also a well-published author. Uh, to uh, your right, we have uh, Dr. Anthony Radice. Anthony teaches English and Drama at Cedar School in Croydon. For his PhD, he specialised in post-modern American poetry. And our chair this evening is Dr. Joseph Shaw. Uh, Dr. Shaw is a fellow and tutor in philosophy at Oxford. He also teaches ethics and political theory. Gentlemen from the college, from myself, a very warm welcome. Joseph, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, thank you, all of you, for, for coming along to um, what, uh, at least... My level of, of ignorance is um, a bit of an unknown quantity. Um, I'm sure I'll learn um, as much as you will uh, about postmodernism. Um, but I just want to hand you over to um, Mr. Boot. Thank you. Um, beauty is supposed to be in the eye of the beholder, which doesn't quite explain why lingerie is so popular. Uh, but uh, when the proposition is put to the test of culture, it rings true, but with reservations. Back in the 11th century, St. Anselm uh, defined culture as faith-seeking understanding. In other words, people's metaphysical presuppositions determine their notion of beauty and therefore the physical output of their culture. As their faith changes, so does their culture. Man-made beauty is indeed in the eyes of the beholder. But that doesn't mean that beauty is entirely subjective. In fact, it is universal, but only within the confines of each civilization. The more securely the beholder is plugged into his civilization, the better able he'll be to perceive its universal beauty. Uh, thus, one can say that beauty is absolute as a constant of a given civilization, but a relative as a variable of perception and also from one civilization to another. This becomes clear uh, when we compare the art of three distinct European civilizations, pre-Christian, Christian, and post-Christian, into which modernism and post-modernism actually fit. I'd like to start with this little illustration there. Uh, the statue of <coughs> Venus de Milo is ineffably beautiful, uh, but what about the model? What, uh, what kind of a woman was she? Was she clever or dim, detached or flirtatious? Did she light up every room she was in, or did she turn it 
in the chamber of sorrow. Was she sexy? We don't know. As our eyes slide off the polished marble surface, we realize that the surface is all there is. There is no content in our sense of the word. word, word. For the Greeks, the form was the substance, and it had a deep philosophical meaning. The great Greeks considered what Aristotle called transcendentals, and what Plato specifically identified as truth, beauty, and goodness, to be the inseparable ontological properties of being. Leaving theologians to decide whether or how this prefigured the Holy Trinity, one can still infer that the deficit in any element of the inseparable triad would automatically produce a failure in the other two. Hence, Plato declared that music is moral law, and Aristotle specifically stated that the morality of music lies in its form. That's why he believed that musical innovation ought to be prohibited, because subversion of existing forms would inevitably result in political subversion as well. Keeping in mind this Hellenic formalism, uh, let's look at this painting produced in the dying moments of Christian civilization. Unlike Venus de Milo, this woman doesn't symbolize outward physical beauty. In fact, she doesn't symbolize anything at all. She is, however, a specific person with her own character, mind, and soul. And that's exactly what the artist sought. But one can't seek what one doesn't believe exists. For Rembrandt to produce this painting, he had to operate within a civilization that believed that each person had a soul created in the image of God. While the Hellenic idea of beauty was skin deep, Western artists looked for the beauty within. This holds true of architecture as well. Hence, admiring, say, the Parthenon, were captivated by its streamlined beauty. The harmony of straight lines intersecting at just the right angles, the symmetrical proportion of shapes and sizes, the measured rhythm of the building, all contribute to the feeling that we're in the presence of noble, restrained perfection. Sacred simplicity, to use the later uh, Roman term. By contrast, if we look at the outside of, say, of, say, Rouen Cathedral, we shall find much that is sacred, but nothing that is simple. The structure was clearly put together by many men over many centuries, which shows in the mishmash of architectural styles and ornamentation springing from the eclectic tastes of the architects, builders, and stonemasons. Though vaguely symmetrical, the front towers look like distant, distant cousins rather than siblings, much less twins. Uh, the ornate facade is overloaded with exorcised spirits of gargoyles and the statues of saints, some of them headless, reflecting modernity's favorite type of art criticism. Uh, <laughs> It's only when we step inside that, that we discover exactly what sanctified the saints and exorcised the, the, the spirits. The message then becomes not merely sacred, but also simple and sacred in its simplicity. We understand then that unlike the Parthenon, a round cathedral was built from the inside out. What matters there is the content not so much the form, and it is the content that dictates the form. While the facade of the Greek temple is the whole book, the facade of the Gothic cathedral is but the table of contents. Extrapolating from there, we reach the conclusion that Hellenic civilization was vectored outwards, not inwards. That's why the quintessential art of the Greeks 
one that expressed the core of their culture, much as music expresses ours, was sculpture, the most external of all arts. Unlike painting, which uses a broad gamut of techniques to guide the eye towards the focal and away from the peripheral, sculpture is more or less free of subtext. Moreover, while great Christian artists were able to put every human expression on the faces of their, of their statues, Greek sculpture is all glorious surface and no inner content. Working in the same medium and ostensibly similar style, Michelangelo animated his Moses with so much humanity that one expects the prophet to, to, to rise from his chair at any moment and unleash his wrath <laughs> on the impious Hebrews. This points at, at the critical distinction between Hellenic and Western cultures, one that goes far beyond aesthetics. For the Greeks, the form was its own meaning. For Christendom, the form is only a shell that contains the real meaning. And as long as the meaning remains the same, it can without damage be expressed in any variety of form, whatever term we choose to attach to it, be it modernist, classical, neoclassical, postmodernist, or whatever. Christianity internalized man and privatized his spirit. Western man heard the words, the kingdom of God is within you, and took them seriously. Rather than seeking the truth in, in outer formal perfection, Western man began to look for it in his own inner self that he now knew was the image of God. Once the shock of this discovery subsided, it had to be expressed culturally. In due course, this led to music becoming the ultimate expression of the Western spirit, for music, unencumbered by semantics, is the most introspective of all arts. But that happened later. At first, architecture acted as the expression of the Christian spirit, and then painting took, took over. Now, if you read art historians, they'll often state the single point perspective, which places the artist at the vantage point of vision, was invented at the height of the Renaissance, only to become common currency in the next few centuries. It's as if the preceding two millennia of recorded culture uh, didn't produce any people who were clever enough to, to observe that lines of vision diverge as they move away uh, from the eye. This is, of course, not so. At the time the humanist renaissance arrived, perspective was old hat. For example, we know that back in Athens, the stage sets of Aeschylus's plays was executed in perspective. Yet, in, in Byzantine iconography, whence Western painting comes, flat compositions were often used, or even reverse perspective, with the figures in, uh, in the foreground often smaller with those in the background, especially if they were divine personages. It was as if Western artists were showing not how they saw the world, but how God saw it. Interestingly, uh, Giotto, uh, generally regarded as the first modern painter, started life as an agnostic wit, sort of a James Abbott McNeil Whistler of the Middle Ages. And at that early stage of his career, he indeed used what later became traditional perspective. Yet, as he acquired faith and his personality deepened, more and more he reverted to the flat compositions or reverse perspective of the old times. And when the Western painting reached the, the, its last peak in the 17th century, many artists, especially those of the Counter-Reformation, such as Zurbaran here, chose to ignore the single point, pers single point perspective altogether. What flat compositions were, uh, and reverse perspective were to painting, counterpoint was to music. Different voices interwoven together 
with none taking a permanent bleeding role, produced a vast oral canvas, as if God listening from his infinite height heard music that way. Music was God's, and the artist's duty was to act as God's mouthpiece. That's why J.S. Bach, history's greatest composer, inscribed his every score, The Glory is God's. Bach, however, was the last great composer expressing himself entirely in counterpoint music. For in the century of his death, the 18th, the West rebelled against Christendom with its founding principles and everything it produced. Like most other revolutions, this one was destructive and obscurantist, which is why its perpetrators referred to it by the misnomer, the Enlightenment. God was no longer the center of the universe. Man himself was. Our civilization became post-Christian. The long-term hope was then, and still is, that this wouldn't affect culture. But we've already seen that aesthetics follows metaphysics. T.S. Eliot expressed this beautifully. If Christianity goes, the whole of our culture goes. Then you must start painfully again, and you cannot put on a new culture ready-made. You must pass through many centuries of barbarism. The Enlightenment signposted the first such century, but the Western culture remained introspective, except that now the artists delved into their own psyche not to express God, but to express themselves. Hence the almost universal use of perspective in painting. Hence also the kind of music where all voices are treated as mere accompaniment to one dominant voice, presumably that of the composer. Of the three arts I'm using as illustrations, music in the long run has suffered mere attrition rather than the almost total devastation suffered by plastic arts and architecture. One reason for this is purely physical. Unlike those arts, music doesn't depend on a fragile physical shell that's easy to destroy. And make no mistake about it, the urge to destroy was overpowering. According to the French medievalist Régine Pernou, 80%, 80%, of France's Romanesque and Gothic buildings were destroyed during the revolution and, which few people realize, the century after it. This destructive animus of modernity was limited neither to France nor to the times olden. It was clearly expressed by post-war British councils that embarked on an orgy of destructions, putting the Luftwaffe to shame. In his book, uh, the Sack of Bath, Adam Ferguson shows how Georgian Bath was syst- systematically destroyed outside the small conservation areas of tourist interest. Altogether, 4,000 houses were replaced with modern monstrosities in Bath. Here are a few <coughs> examples from other c- cities uh, ju- juxtaposing the old and the new with both, by the way, represented not by masterpieces, but by average run-of-the-mill buildings. I really don't have to say much here. A pure desire for formal innovation doesn't quite explain this mayhem. For, as I said earlier, the content of our civilization can be conveyed in any form, as shown, for example, by the great Art Nouveau architect, Antoni Gaudi. This is is one of his great buildings from from Barcelona, where he uses a Spanish architectural tradition, expressing it in, in the entirely modern idiom. This, however, is a rare exception. In all arts, the solipsistic, crypto-destructive urge to be original, to scream I, 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 has produced an unmitigated catastrophe. Underneath it all lurked an ideology 
which, like all ideologists, ha had no link to reality. That's why painting, architecture, and music acquired a literary aspect. Since they no longer spoke for themselves, they now had to be explained in the light of the ideology. Architecture became a petrified reflection of pernicious quasi-political theories from the socialism of Bauhaus to the fascism of Le Corbusier. The latter came up with madcap projects of wiping out old cities entirely and replacing them with concrete and glass boxes in which people lived and worked. Looking around you, and I'm sure you'll find Swindon helpful for this kind of observation, <laughs> uh, uh, you'll see how, how that's uh, set an ideal towards which today's architects and urban planners strive. This aesthetic vandalism wasn't upset by improved functionality either, quite the reverse. For example, London's major concert halls, the Barbican and the South Bank, are not only aesthetic, but also acoustic disasters. Painting, too, became an illustration of ideological theories put forth by art critics, a profession that didn't really exist at the time real art existed. Rather than commenting, the critics began to dictate, and artists disobeyed at their peril. That destroyed the inner logic of art, which was guaranteed eventually to produce the foul obscenity of unmade beds and animals pickled in formaldehyde being regarded as art. Music, too, suffered damage, but mostly in the area of performance rather than composition. Great music was produced throughout the 20th century, and our own contemporary, James Macmillan, shows that the traditional content of our civilization can be expressed in the atonal, atonal idiom, just as powerfully as in any other. <clears throat> Yet, <clears throat> though music hasn't been destroyed, it has been marginalized. To prove this, all you have to do is look up concert listings in the culture section of any broadsheet. The unqualif unqualified term music is applied to pop, whereas real music has to be qualified by the modifier classical. For, uh, uh, for obviously, it is pop excretions that express the content of the post-Christian civilization. As the metaphysical foundation of uh, Western music subsided, the public emancipated by the Enlightenment prefers a shamanistic cult with no musical content whatsoever. A pop concert, uh, that combination of a Nuremberg rally and an orgy, uh, uh, can, can, can only be analyzed within such disciplines as anthropology, sociology, psychiatry, and increasingly pharmacology. Uh, it has nothing to do with music as the term has been understood for the preceding millennia. Metaphysics was the term invented by Aristotle because in many of his works, the chapter on philosophy followed the one on physics. Meta, of course, means after. I think you'll agree that, that in art, reflecting our understanding of beauty, a metaphysical premise comes before its physical expression, determining both its content and its form. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, so we'll now have um, uh, Mr. Reggie Chair. I'm going to fall through here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so after that wonderful broad vista uh, of culture, I'm going to narrow the focus down a little bit. Everyone hopefully has got a... Uh, a sheet of extracts from, from poems. Um, and I'm just going to take you through those in a moment to give you a little tour of some of the highlights or lowlights of the last 200 years in, in poetry, particularly poetry in English, because that's my specialism. 
Um, but before I get there, I just want to give you a couple of images to, to conjure with. Firstly, uh, an undergraduate class in a university uh, somewhere in this sceptered aisle, uh, faced with a postmodern poem. And they're trying to find out what it's about. Uh, they're, they're trying to get an answer out of their harassed postgraduate student who's teaching the class. And he ends up telling, well, it's not really about anything, you know. The whole idea of a poem being about anything is really a bourgeois idea invented <laughs> to enforce conformity on, and obedience on the masses. You know, it's not about anything. It's about nothing. There is no truth, so it's about nothing. Okay, that's what the professionals tell us. There is nothing for poetry to be about. On the other hand, another image to, to conjure with is um, a group of amateur poets gathered to share their work. I don't know if any of you have ever attended these events. They have a sort of a, a religious or confessional aspect to them. Uh, now here, instead of being about nothing, poetry is about me. It's about what I feel. It's all about me. Um, so instead of saying there is no truth, this group of amateur poets with their sort of vomitings onto the page <laughs> say, well... It's about me. I am the truth. You know, you, you, you've got to be interested in this because it's all about me and I fe have deep feelings and I want you to know about them. Uh, and this is how I'm going to share them with you. So on the one hand, this idea that there is nothing for poetry to be about, and we'll see this in some of the extracts uh, that I've, I, I've given to you. And on the other hand, the idea that poetry is about our intensest feelings and it doesn't actually matter how abominably we express them as long as they're sincere and strong uh, and, and, and we share them honestly with the, uh, our victims at the poetry reading. <laughs> so um, how did we get here? And, and that's the story I'm going to be telling, really, through these extracts uh, that you've got here. And, and we're dealing, I mean, very similar issues to what Alexander was talking about earlier. The problem of significance. When you write a poem, you know, why bother? What's it about? Who cares? Uh, these sorts of questions might or might not go through the mind of the poet. They certainly go through the mind of the, of the, uh, the audience at, at, at poetry readings. Uh, you know, who cares? What's it about? You know, why does this matter to me? The problem of significance and the problem of meaning. You know, can this poem point to something beyond itself? Or is it just a surface? Uh, or is it just a personal experience that doesn't have any greater meaning. Um, I picked up particularly in what Alexander was saying about the image of God, uh, the Christian idea that when we look into ourselves, we are looking at the image of God. Now, this guarantees meaning to a certain extent, but when we abandon that, what, what, what could possibly be left? And so let's start with uh, Wordsworth. Um, I'm going to read this out, because I like reading out poetry, and I hope you like hearing it. Um, you, you volunteered to come here, so uh, <laughs> um, I'm going to inflict it on you anyway. Okay, so William Wordsworth, uh, lines written a few miles above Tintin Abbey. Once again I see these hedgerows, hardly hedgerows, little lines of sportive wood run wild, these pastoral farms green to the very door, and wreaths of smoke sent up in silence from among the trees. With some uncertain notice, as might seem of vagrant dwellers in the houseless woods, or of some hermit's cave, where by his fire the hermit sits alone. These beauteous forms, through a long absence, have not been to me as is a landscape to a blind man's eye, but oft in lonely rooms amid the din of towns and cities, I have owed to them in hours of weariness sensations sweet, felt in the blood and felt along the heart, and passing even into my purer mind with tranquil restoration. Feelings, too, of unremembered pleasure, such, perhaps, as have no slight or trivial influence on that best portion of a good man's life, his little, nameless, unremembered act of kindness and of love. 
nor less I trust them, I may have owed another gift of aspect more sublime, that blessed mood in which the burthen of the mystery, in which the heavy and the weary weight of this unintelligible world is lightened, that serene and blessed mood in which the affectations gently lead us on, until the breath of this corporeal frame and even the motion of our human blood, almost suspended, we are laid asleep in body and become a living soul, while with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy, we see into the life of things. So, very powerful and very moving, but what exactly is he pointing to? He says we see into the life of things, but what do we see? What do we actually find out? Actually, nothing. We escape from the world. We escape from it because it's unintelligible. There's actually nothing rational, no no order that we can discover. We can have these wonderful, exciting, thrilling experiences of nature, but afterwards all we can do is really point to them and say, that was fun. (laughs) There's not really much else we can say. You know, it was a great experience, but what did it mean? It can't actually enlighten us. So with Wordsworth, we see... Yes, we search for the transcendental in nature. We search for something, but it remains vague. And it remains more at the level of the senses than the mind. You'll see I've highlighted there sensations, sweet feelings, the blessed mood, and probably most importantly of all, this unintelligible world. And looking through these extracts, I'm going to be tracing two lines. There's the line of Wordsworth and the line of Whitman. Now, Whitman's a cheery American, Walt Whitman, and uh, he, he doesn't present such a melancholy aspect of uh, individualism. He's more of, I suppose, a rugged individualist, and he enjoys his individualism. And you can see his very confident assertion, uh, very famous lines for anyone interested in American literature, as I am, uh, from Song of Myself, 1855. I celebrate myself and sing myself, and what I assume you shall assume, for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. Now I hope you can see here that we, what we have in these two poets, W.W. and W.W., William Wordsworth and Walt Whitman, is on the one hand, Wordsworth starts us off down that path which leads to our frustrated postgraduate trying to explain to the undergraduates that there is, in fact, nothing for a poem to be about. And Walt Whitman, who is confidently proclaiming that actually it's about me. It's about me. And I'm happy with that. Certainly Walt Whitman is very happy with that. It's about me, and it's about you at the same time, because somehow you and me are all part of one pantheistic, vague union, which Walt Whitman uh, perceives. So... In Wordsworth's line, uh, we get to Edward Thomas uh, a couple of generations later, and really a worthy inheritor of his tradition. Um, You see there's an extract from The Glory there, one of his most beautiful poems. And what we see in this is the sadness of the unknowable becoming more and more explicit. (coughs) That unintelligible thing which Edward Thomas is seeking for, that meaning that he's trying to find behind the surfaces of the world. So I'm going to read, this is just the the ending section of the glorious, I've missed out the opening bit. No, hang on a minute, no, this is the whole poem, I'm talking nonsense, yes, it's the whole poem. This is the whole of the poem, the glory. The glory of the beauty of the morning, the cuckoo crying over the untouched dew, the blackbird that has found it, and the dove that tempts me on to something sweeter than love. White clouds ranged even and fair as new-mown hay, the heat, the stir, the sublime vacancy of sky and meadow and forest and my own heart. The glory invites me, yet it leaves me scorning all I can ever do, all I can be, besides the lovely of motion, shape and hue, the happiness I fancy fit to dwell in beauty's presence. Shall I now this day begin to seek as far as heaven 
as hell, wisdom or strength to match this beauty, start and tread the pale dust pitted with small dark drops in hope to find whatever it is I seek, hearkening to short-lived, happy-seeming things that we know naught of in the hazel copse? Or must I be content with discontent, as larks and swallows are perhaps with wings? And shall I ask at the day's end once more what beauty is and what I can have meant by happiness? And shall I let all go, glad, weary, or both? Or shall I perhaps know that I was happy, oft and oft before, a while forgetting how I am fast pent, how dreary swift with naught to travel to is time. I cannot bite the day to the core. So here with Edward Thomas, as with Wordsworth, we see a desperate search for something which can never quite be expressed. And sublime vacancy is really as close as he gets to it. And you'll see that the emptiness, the lack of substance which he perceives in the outer world is reflected in the emptiness of his inner world, of his own heart. You also probably have noticed that the poem ends with question after question. And uh, those questions are never answered. There's only a statement at the end of this inability to get to the essence. I cannot bite the day to the core. I can't find out what the essence of all this beauty is, what lies behind it. He's still searching for that, but there's a sort of incipient despair there about his ability to find it. Then with T.S. Eliot, uh, we see just a very couple of very short quotations I've got from T.S. Eliot there. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Probably one of the nastiest examples of reversing expectations in a poem, very deliberately done there. The evening spread out against the sky was the sort of thing that Wordsworth might have described and uh, pointed to it as something which would lead us on to some deeper meaning, some great moment of knowledge where we see into the life of things. But in Eliot, it has become something dead, something just unconscious. It's almost as though the natural world has lost consciousness of itself. It's forgotten who it is, like a patient etherized upon a table. And Robert Frost, um, aptly named another American poet, um, he was famous for writing poems full of snow and uh, really styled himself as the New England poet. Um, And the snow becomes a symbol of this, what I would call, empty depth in, uh, in Robert Frost. So the sublime vacancy of uh, Edward Thomas, I think gets to it. They were great friends as well, actually, by the way, Robert Frost and Edward Thomas. It, it reaches a new, a new intensity uh, here in, uh, in desert places. Snow falling and night falling fast, oh fast, in a field I looked into going past, and the ground almost covered smooth in snow, but a few weeds and stubble showing last. And lonely as it is, that loneliness will be more lonely ere it will be less. A blanker whiteness of benighted snow with no expression, nothing to express. They cannot scare me with their empty spaces between stars, on stars where no human race is. I have it in me so much nearer home to scare myself with my own desert places. So if poetry is all about me... Um, and it does seem to be all about me, if there's nothing else for it to be about, then uh, Robert Frost here looks into himself and he finds nothing to express. Now, the more cheerful side of things we see here with William Carlos Williams. Now, he really, uh, and he deliberately identified himself as an heir of Walt Whitman in the American line, um, of a cheerful kind of uh, modernism, embracing the modern world, and saying, okay, you know, if, it's, if there is no deeper meaning, then let's just stay on the surface. Let's have a cheerful kind of individualism. So if we look at uh, these two extracts, they're both complete poems, actually, of William Carlos Williams. As you can see, he quite liked writing very short poems. <laughs> 
So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. Now you'll find that in the anthologies of American poetry studied by undergraduates. There's no way you could tell it was a poem just by hearing it, of course. So he's abandoned all pretense of uh, you know, traditional form. And it's a very confident statement. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. Why does it, you know, why on earth would anything depend upon a red wheelbarrow? <laughs> even if it was glazed with rainwater, even though the chickens were particularly beautiful examples of the species, why would anything depend upon it? Well, the simple uh, answer is that it comes back to that, you know, I am the centre of the universe. You know, it depends upon it. You know, so much depends upon it because I just happened to see it and write about it. That's why so much depends upon it. And that's the only possible reason that it could. Equally, uh, this poem, which is really just like a fridge magnet, you could call this a fridge magnet poem. This is just to say. Um, first, you know those little uh, things you can buy where you make poems on the fridge? You could say perhaps this was the inspiration for them. <laughs> this is just to say. I have eaten the plums that were in the ice box and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me, they were delicious, so sweet, and so cold. Okay, that's a poem. Moving on. Okay, Robert Lowell. More in the line of Robert Frost. Now we're getting uh, into uh, modern, well, last couple of generations now with Robert Lowell. Um, here again, we see that for many poets, this being imprisoned inside their own subjectivism, this, in other words, this solipsism becomes a problem. They can't enjoy it as William Carlos Williams does. You know, he just sort of says, well, you know, this fridge magnet is important because I put it there. But for many poets, this is a problem. And you can see this for Robert Lowell as well in this uh, particularly depressing poem of his called Skunk Hour. By the way, Robert Lowell was one of the first confessional poets. So we can really blame him for all this vomiting onto the page that we see in amateur poetry groups, or he's one of the perpetrators of this kind of poetry. I hear my ill spirit sob in each blood cell as if my hand were at its throat. I myself am hell. Nobody's here. So if he's in a hermit cell, do you remember William Wordsworth's hermit cell out in the countryside? Uh, you may have noticed that the hermit didn't seem to belong to any particular religion. He just seemed to be a hermit in the woods, perhaps, of the woods religion. Well, here, if Robert Lowell is in a hermit cell, the hermit cell is more of a prison than a deliberate choice of any kind of isolation uh, from the world. But there are cheerful examples too. Again, Frank O'Hara, um, one of the New York poets, who um, somehow his death was fitting. He was, he was actually uh, killed by a beach buggy. He was uh, at a party on a beach on Long Island and, and was hit by a beach buggy. And I, I always want to laugh at that, but I know I shouldn't. So, you know, I, I, I'm, you, know you, you decide on that one. But um, he, was, he was an art critic, um, and a, a, quite an important figure on the New York art scene, um, which was uh, abstract expressionism at that time. And he claimed he was doing a similar thing in his poetry. But actually, if you look at his poetry, you see that it's not abstract at all. In fact, what we have here is something very personal. Um, but the difference here is that instead of it being it's all about me, it's a small private world which I can create. And that's what gives it strength, the fact that it is private. So the very fact that it's not universal, the very fact that it's not shared with the rest of the world, is what gives this private world its strength. Christmas is green and general like all great works of the imagination, swelling from minute private sentiments in the desert, a wreath around our intimacy, like children's voices in a park. For red, there is our blood, which, like your smile, must be protected from spilling into generality by secret meanings. The lipstick of life, 
hidden in a handbag against violations. So another solution to this problem about what poetry is about is that you make it about your friends, you and your friends. This is what Frank O'Hara did. He had a small coterie of people who were involved in the art and poetry scene in New York. And in his poems, he often mentioned them by name. And here he does dedicate this poem. He calls it Christmas Card to Grace Hartigan. So it's private. And because it's private, it has meaning. But what does that mean for us? What could it possibly mean for us? Isn't this just a a sort of little in-joke between uh, Frank O'Hara and his friends? And a contemporary of his, John Ashbury, I'm going to end with him. Now, he really brings together the two strands. So all the way through, I've been pointing out, you know, the people who embrace the surface, if you like, embrace this idea that there's only individual subjective meaning from the the line of Walt Whitman. And then, on the other hand, people who who mourn it, the poets who mourn it, who struggle with it, who who find it uh, more of a trap than a liberation. And John Ashbery sort of is poised between the two, really. Sometimes he seems to relish remaining on the surface. At other times, he mourns the loss of depth. And we see both in these uh, two extracts. Uh, Here, this is from his most famous poem, Self-Portrait in a Convex Mirror, 1975. Uh, And it's actually uh, a meditation on a a painting by by Parmigianino, the self-portrait in the convex mirror, which Alexander would be much more erudite on than I am. But I'll just look at the poem. I see only the chaos of your round mirror, which organizes everything around the pole star of your eyes, which are empty, know nothing, dream but reveal nothing. I feel the carousel starting slowly and going faster and faster. Desk, papers, books, photographs of friends, the window and the trees merging in one neutral band that surrounds me on all sides, everywhere I look. And I cannot explain the action of levelling, why it should all boil down to one uniform substance, a magma of interiors. So... On the one hand, he recognises the limitations. Why are we in this one uniform substance? Why do we end up on the inside? Why can't we communicate? Why can't we find some general kind of meaning? And on the other hand, he seems to enjoy it. If we look at his poem, This Room, which is the most recent example, we've finally reached the 21st century. Um, This is actually an elegy. It's an elegy for a friend of his, Pierre Martori. Um, and the problem with an elegy is it's about someone who is not there anymore. To whom are you speaking? So we've lost that kind of intimacy that we had in Frank O'Hara's poem because the other is absent. The room I entered was a dream of this room. Surely all those feet on the sofa were mine. The oval portrait of a dog was me at an early age. Something shimmers, something is hushed up. We had macaroni for lunch every day except Sunday when a small quail was induced to be served to us. Why do I tell you these things? You are not even here. So, how could a portrait of a dog be John Ashbury at an early age? This is uh, an obvious question that arises from this poem. And really what we have here is a bizarre restatement of Whitman's assertion. Somehow, everything in the world is me. So I can write about anything because it becomes me. It's all about me, and yet it's universal at the same time. And Ashbury joked that he was trying to write a one-size-fits-all poem that would somehow uh, allow the reader to share his experiences because they would be the reader's experiences as well. Um, So it's an attempt to to bring that confident assertion of uh, a unified experience that Whitman had into the 21st century. But none of these poets have really solved the problems that I stated at the beginning of uh, of the talk. The problems that come from losing a sense of an objective, external truth and beauty that we can appeal to, so that poetry retreats into itself, and the poet retreats into himself, and often ends up feeling completely trapped within himself in a nightmare of solipsism. 
And this is why I think um, poetry, when it's not being written by amateurs, and by the way, I noticed uh, when I was at university that there really were two worlds. There were the worlds of people who were reading the poetry and the worlds of the people who were writing it, and there wasn't very much connection between the two. And the people who were reading the poetry tended to be the people who were studying it for their university degree, because nobody else could really be bothered with it. It was too difficult. Uh, and the people who were writing it, they would never read anything usually more recent than the romantics. They couldn't cope with usually with 20th century poetry, certainly not with postmodern poetry. So the all about me camp and it's about nothing camp, um, they express two sides of the same problem, really. And the problem is, what it can poetry actually be about when we have lost any sense of uh, an objective external truth which it's supposed to point us towards? Thank you very much. Um, I, I myself feel slightly overwhelmed by the amount of material we've been given to, um, to talk about at this point. Now, just to get a general idea, um, are there huge numbers of questions bubbling up in your, uh, in your mind? Could I have a show of hands? People would like to ask questions right away. Um, no, okay, well, I'll ask, uh, <laughs> I'll ask a question then, um, which has been um, uh, troubling me uh, as I listen to these, which is... Um, it seems to me that there are, there are two, two processes going along in parallel with the historical uh, developments which we have been um, explained to us. One is a, uh, what we might call an ideological uh, progression, um, away from the idea of uh, objective uh, truth or indeed external, um, external uh, importance of external things. Um, it just comes down to the artist, um, the artist's feelings, and the, the artist's desire to express those feelings, um, or, or, or just the kind of artist's cry of despair. Um, and the other process is a change or development of the form that art takes. So, obviously, architectural styles, uh, the form of, of poetry, um, and, and so on. Um, now, um, I'm actually quite a fan of, of T.S. Eliot, um, and Eliot got religion at a certain point in his life. Um, he, 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 he underwent a conversion, he became a very fervent Anglican. Um, and this horrified his friends um, and, and made him persona non grata among the progressive literary crowd, which he had hitherto um, been uh, impressing. Um, one of them said, he must be dead to us now. <laughs> because he started writing poems about, um, about you know, mentioning Christ and, and things like that. Um, and, but he still faced this problem of the form of what he wanted to write. Um, and he actually says in his, uh, one of his great religious poems at the end of his life, um, the, the Four Quartets, he says... Um, I can't quote it um, fluently, but it... it, it, it he gives an example of, a, a, a sort of what you might call an old-fashioned poem. It was kind of rhymes and scans. And he says, um, this was a way of putting it in a worn-out poetical fashion. Um, he said, I, I can't write like that anymore. It's impossible. You can't just turn the clock back and pretend it's the 18th century or something and just write like Shakespeare. Or, and, and similarly, a Gaudi, um, architect of, of immense personal faith, um, is doing these extraordinary, very, very modern buildings, but nevertheless trying to use that to express something objective. Um, another example which, which um, Alexander gave us as well, which, which was uh, James Macmillan, who's a Catholic composer, um, using atonalism. Now, there are many people I know who are not um, sophisticated um, literary critics or, 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 or who, will, who will tell you, uh, with tears in their eyes, that you cannot express objective uh, values using postmodern techniques, atonal, um, atonal uh, music, for example, cannot be used. But somehow, um, Jason Miller manages to do that. So I wonder if, 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 if uh, b b both of you would like to say something uh, briefly about this, this problem that we have of um, 
the, the ideological side and the, the formal side, the, the, the stylistic side, um, and uh, what happens if you don't accept the ideology? Well, I, would, I can only repeat what I said before, that a true content of our, the true content of our civilization can be expressed in any idiom. Uh, and uh, I didn't want to step on um, Anthony's toes and, and, and cite poetry, but, but I would cite the four quartets as well. It's an example of a deep sort of religious content expressed in an entirely postmodern idiom. Uh, as long as the artist really has something to express, and as long as what he wants to express is valid, and plugged into uh, and, 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 and into our civilization, and, uh, uh, not just synchronically but diachronically, as, uh, as, uh, as it were, o o over history. Uh, the form doesn't really matter, and you are absolutely right. Uh, it's impossible to write now the way Bach or Beethoven wrote music. It's just not possible. Uh, forms develop. But forms should develop constructively, not destructively. Unfortunately, the, the modern tendency is to use formal, conscious formal innovation as a battering ram uh, rather than as, as a means of expression, as a means of conveying some eternal truth, which is, after all, what Western art has always been about. And, uh, and this constant delving within oneself that Anthony was, uh, was talking about, people look inside them hoping to find some truth. But in fact, they find only themselves there. Mm -hmm. uh, there is nothing else. Uh, so uh, I think this, uh, what, what has happened in some odd sort of way, modernity has reverted to, 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 Hel uh, to Hellenic formalism except that uh, Praxiteles or, or uh, Horace or Virgil or all, the, all those people are nowhere in evidence, uh, you know. But, but, but the art has to rest, as anything else in life, has to rest on the solid metaphysical foundation. When that goes, everything else goes, and Eliot put it extremely well, actually, that... Uh, uh, our, 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 we don't have a choice of a Christian civilization or some other. The choice in the West is between a Christian civilization and none. And that is roughly what we're seeing, which doesn't mean that, the, that art has to be explicitly Christian. Uh, I mean, Bach wrote mostly religious music, not exclusively, but, but, but you don't have to write a cantata or passion to express the meaning of our, of our civilization. You, you listen to, um, I don't know, Prokofiev sonatas written after the Second World War, and you'll hear the same general content, uh, or rather something inspired by the same general content, albeit in a modern idiom. And I think um, I, you can see also that literary realism has been used by authors such as uh, Robert Hugh Benson, uh, and even you know dystopian fiction has been used you know to express a very different message from his contemporaries such as H. H. G. Wells, but using the same kind of style of writing and uh, without any problems at all. Um, uh, another good modern example, and I'm going off poetry, but still literature. Another good modern example is a, an American author called Tim Gatro. Who's, uh, he's from Louisiana, and he writes uh, very much in a, you know, a very accessible uh, mainstream style, realistic style, but he's writing about Catholic culture, so he's expressing something about the, you know, the, the traditional culture of Louisiana, but using a, you know, a, a very contemporary style. So there's, I don't think there's ever an issue with that. So is, there, is there no significance at all to the stylistic developments that we see, the, the, the brutalist architecture or, or eternal music or um, uh, you know, poems that, that, that just is kind of arranged in a kind of random way on the page without mm. any, any formal? Um, I mean, surely the, the collapse of um, 
the formal components tells us something about the development of of the um, of the culture. This is happening. Um, there's a rebellion, isn't there, against from the very form against um, against discipline, symmetry, the, the the classical conceptions of beauty, um, and all those sorts of things. Well, I detect a clear-cut destructive animus in it. I, I, I really don't think that somebody who plonks a modern, uh, you know, hundred-story tower in the, in, in, in the middle of central, central London, completely distorting the whole look and violating every architectural tradition, uh, I don't think that person uh, really is seeking the ultimate truth. <laughs> He's, uh, he, wants, he wants people to look at the building like, uh, like the Shard or the Gurk and say, well, this is me. This, I'm the architect. I mean, no, 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 n- nobody else and nothing else matters. You know, a building that could just about cut it in, in, in the context of Abu Dhabi uh, dis- <laughs> destroys London altogether. I don't think it's a, a much, of the, much of modern... Uh, innovation, formal innovation, is motivated by a genuine desire to find some kind of artistic truth. I think it's purely anomic, in my in my view. Uh, what we're actually talking about here is beauty and ugliness as well, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I mean, because innovation can be for the sake of you know developing a new form, but one that is still beautiful, or it can be just concrete thumped down or just words thrown down, paint flicked onto the canvas, uh, as, a, as actually um, a deliberately anti-aesthetic statement. To say, actually, I, you know, I, I, I am deliberately repudiating any idea of harmony, of form, or anything at all. And that's a different case, really, isn't it? So on the one hand, you can you know, develop forms, new forms, uh, and any idea can be expressed in those. But if, if you're, what you're doing is actually you know, brutally... Uh, <laughs> expressing ugliness, then that's but that's but a different case. But so, but any questions? <laughs> 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 right, great, splendid. The lady at the back. <laughs> Let's take the discussion away from the sort of the cultural arts for a second. Um, I'm, I'm very interested to know what the panel thinks the consequences of. I think there seems to be broad agreement that we are now in a postmodern, can't go back, privacy of the individual. Uh, time for the sort of aesthetic arts. I was wondering what you thought the consequences of that would be on our civic and political lives and whether it is in fact decadent or positive in any respect at all. It's a very good question actually. Um, Yes, indeed it is. (laughs) Who wants to have a go at this one? (laughs) I do think that everything in life is interconnected. And uh, while I disagree with Aristotle that, that musical innovation should be discouraged because political innovation will, uh, p- political subversion will follow as su- su- surely as night follows day, uh, I think our mo- civic and political li- life of today reflects exactly the same tendencies. I think it's, uh, again, the political content traditional to, to, to the West has been totally abandoned and, uh, and has been replaced by, uh, by sort of uh, sham democracy, which, which in fact is rapidly degenerating into being a spivocracy. And, uh, and I think the reason for that is exactly the same as for, for what's happening in architecture. Uh, it's just that we have disconnected ourselves from our political and civic past as surely and as possibly irreversibly as from our aesthetic past. Let's have another question. Yeah? yeah. Um, there's a comment, a comment really. I'm, um, I'm, I'm fascinated that the, the words deeply religious, um, T.S. Eliot got religion, uh, and that line of argument is slightly different from the one which I think you introduced originally, which is about whether things were rooted in man being in the image of God. And that's not necessarily a religious statement. It's just, to me anyway, it's a factual statement. You either believe that or you don't believe that. 
but a lot of what I've heard from both of you um, does seem to give a, there's a contrast between the, a satisfaction with the surface form uh, and a search for deeper meaning, which many people have. And that search for deeper meaning is, to me, is a human characteristic. It's peculiar to humans. Um, and we have a common sense of objective beauty and truth, and, and it's attractive. And for me, both of those are a consequence of human beings being created and made uniquely in the image of God, and that's what separates us from the animal kingdom. So my concern is, if you like, we don't brand, if you like, anyone who goes for deeper meaning as being deeply religious. To me, they're just acknowledging a fact that we're different from the animal kingdom and created differently and uniquely. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, um, I don't see, uh, I'm not quite sure what the distinction is here though, because um, if, if religion is uh, some sort of dogmatic belief about the creator and the creation, then religion could include the belief that we are made in the image of God. Um, so I don't see what the difference is between being religious and believing you're made in the image of God, aren't they one and the same? Well, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think the, uh, you know, I think what you what you des what you described, if you like, was if you like a contrast between mm. those poets who were happy with the surface, yeah, the form, and those who wanted to search for deeper meaning. Yeah, yeah. But is that not just a reflection of the individuality of people, and that in itself makes them unique? Um, well, certainly the poets are very different. Um, some of them seem to enjoy remaining on the surface and relish it, and others uh, find it um, alarming that there isn't anything beneath the surface. They, you know, they, they, want, they, they feel that the, so below the surface there is emptiness. Um, and that's, that's the real problem, whether there is anything beneath the surface. So um, what the content of that might be um, and going back to that, you know, the, the, the portrait by Rembrandt, the content underneath the surface of that painting is the content of that woman's soul. So that's what gives the substance. Um, but when poets begin to feel that there is no soul, i.e. they become materialist, then they find that there isn't anything beneath the surface to look at. And so you end up with this sublime vacancy that you find in... in well, and Thomas. interestingly enough, if you look at music... Uh, the personal faith of the composer doesn't really matter because as long as he stays within the, the Western musical tradition, he will be writing music with a deep inner meaning. As long as he leaves that tradition, he won't. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, 19th century, great 19th century composers, uh, Beethoven, uh, or even late 18th. Uh, I mean, Mozart was not particularly religious. Beethoven, yes, he was sort of a Catholic, but not really. Uh, they were mo most of them sort of days agnostics, but that doesn't matter because they stayed within the confines of, uh, of, of Western civilization, of Western culture. They produced music that had a deep religious meaning, and uh, and their own personality didn't re didn't really come into it. Uh, so some of the, some of them were downright atheists, uh, and and Dito painters. I mean, uh, I'm not aware of Rembrandt, for example, <laughs> being a particularly religious man, although he he must have been sort of religious, but a, a lot of them weren't. Uh, you know, you look at uh, 20th century composers, uh, Schoenberg was not particularly religious, Bartok wasn't, Prokofiev wasn't, but the meaning, the, the meaning, the deep meaning of art was preserved in their work, because they, they, they chose, they, because they were not destroyers, they were creators, they, were, they, they wanted to create within our great cultural tradition. Uh, another question? Um, yes, sir. Gentlemen, uh, I'd like to uh, pick up on uh, Mr. Boot's earlier comment uh, um, saying that uh, Europe faces a stark choice between a Christian culture or no culture at all. And how do you square that with Europe's polyglot um, ethnic 
and, uh, and cultural origins which uh, go back a, a lot further than, uh, than, than the advent of Christianity as a, uh, as a philosophy. Uh, and also the fairly vibrant um, cultural, artistic and musical traditions in a number of areas in Europe which owe absolutely nothing to, uh, to Christian origins. I refer, for example, to, uh, to Celtic art the, um, and to, to, to Celtic musical traditions, many of which predate Christianity. Um, you can also see a lot of that, for example, in the Basque regions of Spain and in numerous other areas of, uh, of, of uh, European society. Well, um, Christianity in general, and Christian f philosophy and Christian culture in particular, have a very strong element of asset stripping to them, uh, meaning that they, that they take what their predecessors and other people have created and incorporated it into Christianity. It's like they used to say about Aquinas, that he baptized Aristotle, for example. He, he didn't adapt Christianity to Aristotle. He adapted Aristotle to Christianity. By the same token, every great composer I can think of was using folk themes, uh, uh, folk songs, uh, as material for what, uh, for, for what they, were, uh, they were doing. Uh, I, I, I know a bit of Celtic music and a bit of, a bit of uh, Basque music, and, and, and I think they're absolutely fascinating. But I don't think they have this universal appeal, uh, this, uh, this universalist potential, as it were, to, to act as the major adhesive of our, of, of our civilization. Uh, I, I think when you talk about the civilization, you're talking, talking about a very collective entity. And, and very broadly co uh, co uh, collective. Um, people, to, to, for a civilization to function, most people within it have to sh share certain presuppositions. You know, I don't, I don't think uh, Basque music can function in that capacity much as I like listening to it. Question over there. Quick one, um, there was some criticism about the uh, formality behind uh, animals as uh, being travesties um, in so-called you know, postmodern art. But surely this, and opposed to a better example, would be Gunther von Hagen's body worlds with the 3D representation uh, of the human body. It's just a continuation of something like Vitruvian Man. It's just a modern technique applied to what's been done for time immemorial, and it's educational for the masses rather than for the self. So therefore, in that regard. Can you really argue personal things? Well, well I, I couldn't comment on that specific work of art. Could you? I, I, don't, I don't know. Do no. I it's this chap who, who just dissects uh, people, uh, bodies, and... Um, uh, and <laughs> <laughs> while wearing a hat. Um, <laughs> I, the hat, I think, is very important. It, it, it's 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 very um, it's very sh it's 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 a it's a wide brimmed um, hat. He he, it's 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 very much uh, uh, an example of showmanship, um, and the fact that people react in a, uh, in a entirely natural kind of uh, ooh, you know kind of uh, way is is, is um, uh, really. Um, um, turns the wheels of the uh, publicity machine that, that, that he's created and he goes around um, doing these dissections um, sometimes irrespective of the, um, the legal <laughs> the niceties um, but um, I personally um, I, I think that's got very little to do with Vitruvian Man and uh, Vitruvian Man was an attempt to I'm not that I know who I am talking about something I really don't know anything about but it's it's um, it's, it's objective, it's a, it's a concern of, with, with scientific knowledge, um, and it's, yeah, there's a, that, that, that moment of, in, in our history, history where um, art has not become separated from science. So the, the, the scientific and the artistic are actually the same. I mean, this, the, 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 the accurate drawings of those Renaissance artists were what you had instead of photography or any other thing to, to show um, uh, pictures of, of um, skeletons and, and, and anything else. Um, so uh, this chap, um, what's he called, Von Hagen? Um, it's, it's, it's purient. It's just, it's, it's just a thrill-seeking, um, egoistical thing. Uh, to do, is it, uh, as I say, to create a little show to give people a little frisson of of, of horror, um, 
uh, with the and the, the idea that it's a, it's a kind of a genuinely scientific or informative or educational is is the is the thinnest. I mean, here I am talking. <laughs> like, you can disagree with me, but like it, as far as I can see, it's a, it's the thinnest veneer and excuse um, for what he's doing. I mean, it, it, that's what he says if he's criticised. But if he was interested in education or objectivity or the truth or anything, he wouldn't be doing it in the way he's doing it. The whole tenor of the thing is is to do with thrill seeking um, and and this, this this showmanship um, aspect of it. In just the same way, um, you know, a hundred years ago, um, the you know the the, the circus uh, bringing bringing the um, uh, wild animals to you know to the uh, English villages might have defended himself by saying, "Oh, yeah, it's all very educational. You've got education, nothing to do with it. He just wanted to have fun, you know, cracking the whip and making the lions jump." I mean, that's, um, perhaps people did learn a little bit about lions uh, from going to the circuses um, in those days, but <laughs> education it was it was entertainment. I don't think it's the function of art to educate in such a direct fashion, anyway. I mean, Rembrandt with, with, with kind of paintings, a lesson of anatomy with uh, all, the, all the innards being pulled out of a body. Uh, but he wasn't doing it to, 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 make, to, make, to make an anatomical point, you know. He was doing it for some, for some, for some, some other reasons. Uh, art does educate, but not in a crude, direct manner. Well, possibly it was different in the, um, in the 16th century. When there was no photography, you know, if you wanted to, I mean, even even in the 18th, 19th century, if you you you, you guy your book of of uh, uh, describing flowers, for example, and what's it got in it? It's got these beautifully painted, hand drawn pictures of flowers. Well, why? Because they hadn't invented photography. Well, it's art, though. I well, mean, it's it's, uh, it's the Spanish Duchess once said when they were ex- somebody was extolling the virtue of. Uh, of Velasquez and Goya saying that they were ineffable geniuses. And she said, genius? Those were the people my family hired before they invented photography. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Do we need to finish? One more question. The lady with the white um, jumper. Um, you've just made a comment about um, whether it's a legitimate function of art to um, inform us, to educate us. Just going back to the the discussion about the the body works um, art, is it ever a legitimate function of art just to entertain us? Are you you asking me? No, I don't. No, I don't think so. I I, I think think entertainment may be a byproduct of art, but the moment it becomes its sole desideratum, art stops being art. Yeah, I, well, certainly poetry has always been concerned about deeper meaning. Um, <coughs> and when that deeper meaning was self-evident in, in the Christian era, then poetry was much more sort of confident and it's become much more anxious. That's, you know, that's what I was trying to point out, that actually poets do want to teach us in some way. I think they do want to actually um, point out some deeper meaning to things and when they can't do that they start getting pretty depressed as you can see from from, uh, Robert Frost so um, I think that by its very nature as soon as you write a poem you're saying this means something I want to show you something I want to point out some you know thing that you haven't noticed before so yeah it's never only about entertainment Uh, you know it just wouldn't it wouldn't compete with uh, with a broad-brimmed hat and a, and a bisection <laughs> or, show, or anyway, a bearded it's, lady. It's yeah. my personal favourite. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, uh, thank you very much. I'm not even going to attempt to try and sum up this evening. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. I, 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 how long have you got? I, I would just like to put on record uh, very grateful thanks to Mr. Alexander Boot to uh, Dr. Anthony Radici and for Dr. Joseph Shaw for, for chairing this evening's discussion. So thank you very much. This is the penultimate uh, seminar in the Cortex series. We have one more to go. 
If you thought this evening was challenging, have a look at your cards. <laughs> the subject for the next uh, talk is Wisdom and the Meaning of Life. <laughs> uh, the opportunity to sign up um, is now, so if you go to the desk, you can sign up for the next one. Um, I'd like to, like to also put on record our grateful thanks because the speakers this evening have come here completely voluntarily and uh, have, have offered their services freely, which has made the, the whole thing viable. So once again, thank you very much. And for those who've signed up for supper, please do, do join us. Um, our speakers are staying with us this evening, so if you want to engage with them individually, then please do so. Thank you.